Hello and welcome to Critical Rollback. My name is Val. I am Jana. If you're listening to this, you have started listening to our podcast, Critical Rollback, as you can imagine by clicking this uh, particular recording with the title Critical Rollback. I don't know how else to warn you. This is our session zero of the podcast where we tell you what to expect, who we are, what we are doing, and just go over some general stuff to be aware of before starting this. Much like a session zero of a campaign. Which is used to set expectations for the party so no one is disappointed when you don't do anything they want you to. Okay. In a real D&D game. Like a real D&D game that is not a recording on the internet, except it is also. So first of all, what exactly is this? So, we are a critical retrospective. So we are a recap podcast looking back at the episodes of Campaign 1 of Critical Role. Uh, one episode at a time. We are, at the moment, a uh, bi-weekly podcast, which does not mean that we release twice a week, but once every other week. Uh, our main interests are overanalyzing the story, looking at the themes, the characters, the kinds of things that makes us excited as fans, as well as the things that make us a little bit less excited as fans. Yeah, so our approach to this is basically that we're going to be analyzing every episode as it is, but also in the context of the greater things, of the grand scheme of the campaign, with themes and character arcs, because those are the things we're into. And this is also going to be like, occasionally a bit of a bit of a historical record where we just look at things like the production value or how the cast has changed haircuts numerous times or what fan reactions to several beats have been so we might go into youtube comment sections once or twice <laughs> apologies in advance speaking of apologies something that we should also get out of the way is content warnings that we will be talking about uh, some of which we're going to be uh, covering every single episode as they come up. And some of these are just as general warning that we're going to state now in case you have no previous exposure to Critical Role or uh, are listening to this as you're watching and, and would like some warnings. Yeah, like the entire game is live recorded, at least for Campaign 1, the change a bit for Campaign 2. Uh, so it doesn't come with any additional trigger warnings. And we would like to add some for our podcast. So we have compiled a list of common triggers that we are going to talk you through. And either warn you that we are going to warn of these every episode if they occur. Or that we are not going to warn of these in every episode because they occur several times. Yes. Uh, so after we go through the content warning every episode, we will also be going over the spoiler warnings. Uh, we will also be talking about some of the major spoilers for throughout the, in the session zero, but uh, in every episode we will to give you a um, a particular mention of of uh, extraordinary spoilers. For example, a campaign CR two spoilers or other media that we spoil completely. Uh, generally, we will be talking about because this is a retrospective. We will be talking about campaign one as a cohesive whole, so don't expect to only have the episode spoiled. We might be talking about a late campaign spoiler while talking about the introduction of the characters in the early episode. Again, as you recall, we said that we are really into analyzing themes and characters, so it's only natural that when we are at the beginning we're going to point out how this develops for in the in the future into the characters we know and love. And finally, we're going to tell you a little bit about just us as people, our history of this critical role, and how we got to know each other. Yes, so after we have all of the warning stuff out of the way for our regular episodes, we are just going to talk about stuff like what happened before we had Sam's ads? What what do they use for an intro, if any? Yeah, occasionally there isn't an intro. We will also be talking about like the introduction of, of certain changes and things like that. Uh, and uh, rating how uh, the ads are. That is going to be a particular component. As soon as we get to them. As soon as we get to them. Like, it, it, it apparently... It takes like a ridiculously long time for them to actually get there. So in the beginning, it's just going to be announcements of what stuff they're in, or if they actually have merch. Yes, I think the sort of the the which the way the that, evolution there is amazing. Yeah, the the way that I envision this section in the episodes is is we're sort of cataloging how the actual format of the episodes change, like the physical episodiness. You know what I mean? Like the the material of it. Uh, so we're talking about things like. 
how the recording quality is, though that feels a little bit hypocritical, but how does the studio look? How do the, the cast are? Uh, who's at the table? Who's not at the table? Things like that. Is is the Twitch chat shoved into our face during the session? <laughs> yes. This is uh, half a, uh, an analysis that is very biased and half sort of an archival project, I suppose. Yes, we are basically historians. We are critical we are historians, historians. Nostalgic for this gem of, of internet history from five years ago. Yes. Six years ago. So if something horrible happens and we lose all record of campaign one, we can rebuild it from scratch in our own image. Uh, that sounds a bit like hubris, but okay. <laughs> okay, so after we, we go over the out of game tidbits, we will be talking uh, about sort of the, the just the, the the bare bones of the recap. Yeah, we're trying to place where the episode is at in like the arc, what happened previously, how we got here, just to catch everyone up to speed. If you don't watch every single episode and just want to get to the ones you like, which we emphasize with. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we will be talking about just the actual contents of the episode. Uh, we will be trying... Which we are going to try and start with a high-level recap. Yes, a high-level recap, which we will try our best not to delve immediately into analysis, but uh, <laughs> that's what the outtakes are for. <laughs> yeah, D just sticking to a bare-bones summary of the thing is going to be hard, but we're going to try. It is. And after we're done doing that, we are going to focus on several aspects of each episode that we think warrant further analysis. Right. And after we an analyze everything, we will be introducing the highly scientific, peer-reviewed, patent-pending Pervon Scale. The Pervon Scale. Yes, the, the beautiful Pervon Scale. The name that's going to make sense 44 episodes in. Don't worry about it. If you're episode one, you're wondering, who, who the hell is Pervon? You'll get there. What is a pervon? What is a pervon? Well, we'll explain to You'll you what there. a pervon is. A pervon is an acronym, a brilliant acronym, composed by a, a, a uh, academy accredited genius, such as myself. Basically just yourself, yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's, so let's go over the, the letters in this acronym. The first letter, P, is for possess. Uh, in this section, we will be over... Which we're going to rate just how bad the audio quality is and be complete hypocrites, as mentioned before. Yes, but we'll also be talking about out-of-game points in this, especially. So, pretty much anything can go into this. The, the previously hair. mentioned interface with the Twitch chat into our face. Or some stuff of the set design, like how hard is it to fix, the, fix those sconces. Um, outstanding outfits... The evolution of the maps they fight on, and ooh, look at that full-sized bear in the background. <laughs> I think we're going to be giving a lot of points for the stuff bears, personally. Yes, also to note, these points all go into the positives or the negatives, so you can have like a negative scale for an episode. Yes. We try to limit it to plus five to minus five. Mm -hmm. That's the range. That is the range. We are trying not to... We might exceed things on certain ch certain situations, but we are known to be, while the scientific scale is very accurate and unbiased, we are not biased. We are not biased. Uh, we are not unbiased scientists, correct? I think you kind of lost the plot with a double negation there, but yes, yes to all you just said. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, go ahead and explain <laughs> uncomfortableness for me. You is for uncomfortableness, which... Um... As you might have guessed, is one we are going to, probably going to assign negative values to more often than not. And those negative values go for just... Um, the example I listed in here is just how hard is it to re remember Jermon Sword's pronouns, goddammit. And apparently very hard. <laughs> it's This one is, this is, is actually a, a scale which it is very hard to give positive points to because it, it kind of just goes to neutral. But we also will give points for... Positive uncomfortableness. What does that well, mean? We don't know. We'll figure it out. Good representation? Sensitively handling difficult issues? All of the above. Can we think of an example off the top of our heads? No, but that's only because we only tend to, tend to focus on the negative and we're going to break through that we're with trying. this uh, completely unbiased scientific scale. Eventually. Eventually. 
The scale is Eventually. perfect. We are we are imperfect. We are imperfect humans. The scale perfect. Uh, <laughs> R <laughs> the R in Pervon stands for role playing realness. This is for moments when the role playing is especially visceral. Uh, you'll have these specific moments in campaign one where it feels like the DM kind of melts away and and it's just the players talking to one another or really embodying these characters. Um, this could also plucking your heartstrings, plucking your heartstrings, making you laugh. Uh, all of the above. This unfortunately can also go in, in the negative direction for when role playing is, is especially obstinate, whether or not uh, role playing very. I'm not gonna. We're not judges of when role playing is good or bad, but when there's refusal to yes and or the role playing is especially. This is mostly probably going to be positive scores for when we feel like the role playing is especially visceral. Yes. I think the only times you're going to what negative scores in this section is when a character just plain up refuses to engage or have a single conversation about anything. I wonder what that's going to come um, up. Mm-hmm. I wonder. So the V in our scale is where we're going to be showing our entire asses, all two of them, <laughs> and just let go of any pretense that we are not extremely biased. It is for vexiness, which um, is a it's a pun. It works better written out because the name <laughs> Vex is in there. Yes. As in... <laughs> also the name... Just That's just... Also... Vex yeah. is just... If you were talking in K-pop stan terms that I have a regrettable amount of knowledge of, she is our base? She's our base. Yes, base. Base is the term. She is our favorite character and we... Um, and our love for the show is mostly proportional to our love of her. Yes. Also, it is worth mentioning that Vex, unfortunately, gets her uh, spotlight taken away often. Or is given some... Un- oh, what does. we feel to be unfair harshness in, in certain uh, judgment calls. So we feel that it is important to... Also the fact... Yeah. Also the fact that she just gets the least singular plot moments to herself. Yes. But we're not going to get into the specifics here. We're just saying that we'd like to... Give points for episodes where we highlight the vexiness in particular. And Laura just gets to be herself in all her glory. Yes. Also, this is a double whammy. Because it's not vexness, is it? It's vexiness. Yes. Which is like parenthesis C-Y after the vexed part. Which is a, y- if a you don't old know, archaic term. Yes, back in the day in the wild wild west when no ship names were settled, vexy in the tradition of old anime shipping, I'm going to assume, where the top part always goes first, <laughs> was a very early ship name for what we now know as Persalia. God, that is which so violates this rule, but sounds prettier. It's anime shipping, what... <laughs> I know, I, I know. Mean, I'm not holding you accountable for the anime shipping standards. We have only... No, anime board. assigned top and bottom as, as personality categories before it was cool, we just called it Seme and Uke. <laughs> Yes, so this is not just our appreciation for Vex, but our appreciation for Persalia. Persalia, the gold standard for ships. The gold standard for ships. I think we've spent, we've, we've dwelt enough on our favorite category here. Uh, and it's, Which is, by the way, very representative of how we're going to do this. Yes. <laughs> this has, no, this, this category might be a little weighted. No, we're not going to lie. It's a little weighted. Uh, the A. And that's why we warn you ahead of time. The A in 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 Pervon stands for action, uh, and this doesn't just mean you know the more action the better, but we're talking about quality over quantity here. Uh, are there battles here that are particularly interesting to watch? Are they very engaging in terms of character? Are there interesting mechanics going on, or are they dragging on? Are they you know, very? Is this just a slog to get through? Is nobody at the table having fun anymore because this battle has been going on for four hours and none of the abilities work? Yes, or to the contrary. Is this a situation where it feels like every single party member has uh, something to do and, and they're very much engaging with one another and doing these interesting things? This is a tense combat. Is it a, is it a combat that reveals character? Uh, sort is, of. You... Is it a combat with high stakes that goes with the narrative really well? Yeah. If you want to really, like... Are they using the combat mechanics creatively? Is there an 
surprising display of tactics. If you want like a, a physical comparison here, imagine the Kraken fight on one end, or the lower end of the spectrum, and the kill box uh, on the high end of the spectrum. If any of those things already mean anything to you. <laughs> if not, they will soon. They will... Soon is a relative term. That's what, episode 54? <laughs> okay. And 88? And take us to the bridge, Yana. Okay. So the final part is the N, which is for nine cents. It's another pun. Um, not to throw too much shade on campaign two, which, but it is worth mentioning that we enjoyed it a lot less. And this part of the scale is just means... How is the ratio between actually focusing on the plot or just indulging in shenanigans? But don't don't worry, shenanigans aren't inherently bad. No, shenanigans can shenanigans be very can good. be telling Yes, they can just be telling you about the characters and 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 or just be or just be real fun. Or they can just devolve into forty five minutes of abusing innocent guard NPCs. If that's your thing, good for you. It's not our thing. We got to duck points for that. Yes. A good score of this, not always, but sometimes is looking at the DM and seeing how bleak the DM, the DM looks about the shenanigans. <laughs> that is helpful, yes. Yes, he's a helpful, he's a good barometer, that Matt. All right, so that has been our Pervon scale. Moving forward. Yes, that's how we're going to close out every episode with a completely scientific, accurate number in the end of it that's going to tell you all of the things. Yes. Except for it isn't because even when we dog points for we just this is held together with duct tape and a potato every episode, it can still be a good episode. Yes. So this is for fun. It's for fun and for format. This is for fun, for format and for archival purposes. Uh, the unattainable peak that you can imagine is twenty five points, right? Uh I think technically 30 if we give positive points in everything. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's it's fairly impossible, but I'm I, sorry, I did the math wrong. So, uh, <laughs> the... This is fine. The important thing is to introduce uh, lovely mistakes with highly important information so that you can't cut it out. Uh, so out of a potential 30 and a theoretical minus of... Uh, also 30. Also 30. Negative 30. Which hopefully will never actually happen. So technically a zero is the average score. <laughs> yes. The median score. The median aver- score. Average. We can only calculate averages when we actually have the numbers. Yes. Uh, and it's important neutral. to Neutral. Zero is neutral. <laughs> it's important to note that even when we dock points and even when we criticize the show, we're, we're doing it... We're, we're taking all this time and consideration and you know, particular nitpickiness because we love this show. Yes. We are very firm believers in the fact that you can love a thing to death enough to want to talk about hour-long episodes on a bi-weekly format and put it out there and still be critical of it. Actually, you could argue that we are critical with this thing because we love it so much. (laughs) Because we love it so much. We've been talking about... Critical Role campaign one for almost four years now, and we have no signs of stopping. So, obviously, we do really love this media. Yes, and we don't, we don't subscribe to the uh, unconditional positivity mindset. Yes. There can absolutely be bummers here. We find that unconditional positivity and just um, defending every single choice by the cast or, the na- or in the narrative at all costs is actually a more toxic mindset than just engaging in, con- in critical conversation about it. And also we just really like critically engaging with media. It's like our thing. Yeah, it is our thing. So that's what we're going to be doing here. And one aspect, this is a segue, one aspect that we could always be, that we were always a little critical about and we can, and nowadays can be really critical about because episodes are pre-recorded, are the trigger warnings or lack thereof. Yes. So we're now going to walk you through a list of common trigger points and explain if that we are going to warn for them and if they occur in an episode 
or if we are not going to warn for them because they occur in basically every single episode. Yes. Which uh, take this ep- take this uh, episode zero to be sort of your your proto trigger warning for every single episode, and we do take these very seriously. We're not making any jokes about trigger warnings here, uh, except when they do. But we're gonna try to keep those to a minimum. Yeah, we're trying to treat this with the seriousness it deserves. Yes. So, to begin. Uh, with a, a big, yeah. phenomenal, really light-hearted topic of, of rape and sexual assault, which we will be uh, tagging every single episode that they appear in. Um, it is not common that they appear. Yes, there's no no such thing as like on-screen rape or sexual assault. And I think at the most, um, it's going to be alluded to. And when they allude to it, we're going to warn about it. Yes. So we will be talking about it when it shows up, and we will be mentioning that. The same goes for abuse of the physical, mental, emotional, verbal, or sexual kind. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I, I personally consider like manipulation of a, of a particular like intimate relationship to be part of this, which I think actually does come up in certain situations. So that might actually be something that we tag. It does. Yeah, with this is this might be something that comes up. Uh, but we will be taking this very seriously and, and mentioning it every single episode that we can. Uh, similarly, child abuse slash pedophilia. Uh, this does not happen often. This isn't... This is... A, a, I'm pretty sure it's mentioned exactly once... Yes, occasionally it is, it is mentioned... And Bal is going to have words for you on that part <laughs> when it happens. Yeah, it, it's probably going to be mostly mentioned as part of a joke, but just to be safe, we are going to be saying, hey, there was some joking about child abuse slash pedophilia in this particular episode. Oh, that too. I think that crosses over with the death, deaths we're going to warn about. Oh, yeah. So, when it comes Camp to... Camp one was a fun time sometimes. Yes. So when it comes to deaths, uh, that's going to be particular because this is a, a D&D campaign. Yes, so the list we worked out differentiates between animal death and just death or dying. And animal cruelty or animal death is one of those things we will not be mentioning every single episode. Yes, we will occasionally be mentioning it- when abuse towards animals gets particularly heinous, but whenever they're not fighting like an, a human combatant, which is fairly frequent it's safe to assume that there's going to be an animal death of, of some nature in, in the episodes just because that's how D&D works it's an animal or just a non-humanoid creature or something um, again if they start a fight with something it's probably going to die yeah so I, the really we're only going to warn when it's sort of out of combat or uh, you know Animals being Especially imperiled. gratuitous. Especially gratuitous. Uh, we're thinking about, like, moments where, where Trinket is in severe peril, for example. I think that's something we can warn about. Yes. Uh, yes, it's probably a very good example. Similarly, death or dying. Again, every... Basically, every episode of the fight scene, with very few notable exceptions, is going to have someone dying. Yeah. And most episodes have a fight scene. There are several without fight scenes, but just a lot of fighting sometimes. Sometimes there's just a lot of fighting. And occasionally we do have moments where not even combatants will die. Sometimes there are moments where uh, civilians will be killed or uh, some, you know. It's yeah, we're going to warn for that. And we are also going to go the fan fiction route. And warned for major character death. So if a named character we have an attachment to dies, even if it may or may not be permanent, we are going to warn about it at the beginning of the episode. Self-interest behavior. So uh, when we're talking about this, we're talking about self-harm, eating disorders. Um, because this is a fantasy setting, sometimes there's like less... Hard, like harder to define moments of self-interest or allowing harm to come to oneself, essentially, uh, such as in the case of animus or things like that. This is just we are going to be talking about this, but uh, and tagging ahead of times. But sorry, not tagging, but warning. 
uh, at the beginning of the episode. But yeah, this can be... Yes, I think... Hmm? I think this is also where we can put just the occasional overuse of alcohol as a coping mechanism. That's true. I think that also counts as self-interest behavior. So sometimes there's substance abuse. Which they do a lot. Yeah, they cope a lot with alcohol. Like, as do many, um, as do many creators on the internet, uh, for a quick joke, but we are very well aware that this can be a little more serious for some people, so we are going to warn about it. Yes, we are. So in this case, we are including a wide variety of things as self-interest, including things that are uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms and uh, just allowing harm to come to oneself through negligence. Yes, on and on the on an escalation of that, basically something we're also going to warn of if it comes up is suicide or suicidal tendencies or ideation. Yes, I I. I don't think this needs to be Wait. explained very much, but if, if something is treated within the canon as a suicide, we will be warning it and treating it seriously as a suicide. And if it should have counted as a suicide, if you have put your mind to it, we are also going to get into that Yes. in the very distant future. Furthermore, excessive or gratuitous violence. Grog exists. It's just... It exists. Grog is it's basically there in most fight scenes. <laughs> Grog is essentially Grog and Keyleth. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. No, there's no escape for Keyleth in this. Grog and Keyleth are basically two walking examples of excessive or gratuitous violence. Except for when we are in full no mercy Percy mode. Occasionally, he is also there. Uh, we're not gonna. I be... think everyone gets moments of gratuitous violence. To be honest, like <laughs> that's equality. This is the, this is actually positive uncomfortableness points because everybody gets to participate in, in brutal gratuitous <laughs> violence. <laughs> so we are like expect some degree of violence with every combat encounter, mm-hmm. and some degree of violence with many out of combat encounters, usually involving grog. Yeah, um, we are not going to warn about violence happening. It's going to be in basically every episode. We are going to warn if it gets a little out of hand. Yes, if it gets to the point where we kind of gag in our mouth a little bit, we're going to be mentioning it. That's going to be your forte (laughs) because I'm very desensitized to violence. Uh, I am not. I'm going to be, this is my point, I'm going to be the judge of when violence gets gratuitous. So you can expect my careful and, and precise judgment. Okay. Next point in our list is what we have dubbed deprivation of personal autonomy. This is going to mean things like kidnappings or things like mind control or just losing control or autonomy over your own actions. This is a bit of a it's dumb a thing category. that happens. This is a- yeah, it's also just a thing that covers D&D spells that involve mind control or just charming someone or just general loss of autonomy. Yeah, this is what we call uh, in... in- you know, uh, scientific categories, uh, a waste bin taxon. This is just where everything goes, where we can't really... Is it a kidnapping? Is it a brainwashing spell? Is it uh, someone being possessed? We're just going to all count it as deprivation of personal autonomy. I mean, I mean, many times the brainwashing spell results in a kidnapping. Oh, yeah, or like but... a modified memory. Oh, yes. Yes, this goes here. So whether it... That's good. Yeah. Whether it is magical or mundane, when physical autonomy or, or personal autonomy, mental, physical, anything like that, is specifically and pointedly uh, ignored. Overridden. Overridden. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Overridden. We will be mentioning it as deprivation of personal autonomy. Uh, pregnancy slash childbirth. This does not come up often. I mean, there's... Unless you go into the comment section of episodes very late into the campaign because people were being stupid. Uh, yes. No, in all seriousness, there are... I remember off the top of my head one pregnant character once. And if this comes up, we're going to inform you of its existence. Yeah. The same goes for miscarriages slash abortion, the next point on our list. Yeah. Which I don't remember coming up during the campaign at all. But if we misremember that and it occurs, you will be warned. You will be the first to know. Uh, blood. 
third after the two of us. <laughs> third after the two of us. Blood. Being I'm a piss. Trying. Again. <laughs> Fight scenes. Vampires. Gratuitous violence. Gratuitous Lots violence. Of Swords that drink blood. Gratuitous. It's if we tag, if we warn for every single case of blood, it's just going to be every single episode. So just consider this your warning. This campaign will have a lot of blood in it. Yes, we are going to mention it if it if it turns up in copious amount of quantities or notably outside of a fight scene where you would expect it. For example, is a, is a pool of some kind. Somebody goes bathing in it. Somebody goes swimming. Then we will mention... Several somebodies, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> that cannot be sanitary. <laughs> sorry, it just occurred to me how unsanitary that is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. HIV is not a thing in this universe, I suppose, and also s- s- neither is... Is it called sepsis? I suppose so. The thing you get when you mix different blood types in a non-compatible way. I mean, I'm not a blood scientist. This should scientist. just be one big congealed clump, I'm a shouldn't it? Scientist. This is getting gnarly. Hmm? I'm a critical role scientist. I'm not a blood scientist. Not a not a not a phlebotomist. I can. I can figure out paternity with blood types, and that's it. So yes, I think we've it's a useful skill in some fandoms. <laughs> I think we've given enough warning about blood without accidentally triggering someone for blood. No, I think we're past that point. <laughs> we're sorry. We're good at this. We might cut this. We might cut this. All right. So, um, a point that warrants a bit of a, of discussion is that our list includes mental illness as a um, as a point on it, but that gets a little difficult. Yes, especially since uh. I don't believe any of uh, any of the mental illnesses which the characters famously have. Uh, sometimes they're, they are spoken at, 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 out of universe. Um, they're never really regarded as mental illness. And mental illnesses uh, explicit, explicitly within canon. So, for example, if a character has depression, they're probably not going to be treated for depression within canon, even though they are showing symptoms. Yes, so... For example, Keyleth has several panic attacks, so she might have an anxiety disorder. This is treated as a character trait, not as a diagnosis. Yeah, so we're not going to be triggering for Keyleth having an, uh, an anxiety disorder or mental illness, but we are going to be making note of when she has panic attacks. Or, uh, you know, we're going to be treating these as they come mostly through symptoms, even though we understand that the, the, a mental illness is not just its symptoms, but it, it does make it significantly easier to keep track. Uh, so in the case of, of sexual content, again, this is something that shows up quite a lot, but on occasion it does show up enthusiastically. Um, yeah, there's a sliding scale between early episode brothel visits and... Um, Sex scenes that are heavily implied between characters at the end of their slow burn. Yeah, or, or like, for example, somebody making a sex joke. Uh, I don't think we need to trigger warning. Do you have a trigger warning for whenever somebody I'm talks pretty sure about... we won't even be hmm? able... <laughs> I don't even think we we're going to be able to warn of every single sex joke. No, of every single count of, of dick lightning. Or fisting. Or vor. And other such beautiful terms. They don't even. I don't even think that they consider war to be something uh, sexual. It just happens. It just happens so much. But we can make note of every time it that just it happens. happens, like physically when there is a, a non-explicit sex scene, or characters are are said to have sex. So uh, we will be mentioning. Oh, that. weirdly explicit sex scene because we are rolling for how to satisfy sex workers at a brothel, which is an early thing, like. They cut down on that, but it is present during early episodes. Yes. So that is going to be a sliding scale, but we will be mentioning it when it is especially notable. Uh, And lastly... But forgive us if sometimes we are very enthusiastic about the fact that we finally get some sexual content (laughs) between the main ship. (laughs) We're sorry. We're simple human beings. And uh, do do you want to state the last one? Yeah! Also, we are going to try our best to warn up just 
the generally upsetting content, um, so stuff like racism, which in a game with fantasy races, you know, <laughs> happens. Happens. There's also... It happens. This is in part why the, the uncomfortableness category is there in, in, in our ratings, because occasionally... Yes. When you are trying to create a fantasy settings, you wind up having some very non-fantastical, uh, very real-life racisms and others, uh, sexism, homophobias, transphobias, things like that. They just crop up because... I've never heard those used in, a pl in plural before. <laughs> uh, me neither. I just invented that today. Just decided to go So many it. different homophobias, you guys. Many homophobias. No, actually, okay. At least one. <laughs> there are some scenes that cross lines sometimes and that have caused lots of discourse in their time. Mm -hmm. We are going to be try to be as sensitive as we can about it. We're going to warn about it beforehand. The fact that we list this, by the way, is not... Is not to say that we think that the show itself or the or the people working on it are are any of these things things. Yeah. But we live in a society, we internalize some things, and while you might not be a racist, sexist, homophobe, transphobe, sometimes you do without even wanting to a racism, sexism, homophobia or transphobia. And we also want to be very clear that Impact in th these cases matters more than intent. This is not a court of law. Yes. You can do any of these things without meaning to. That doesn't make you necessarily a horrible person. It makes you someone living in a society that is colored by these things. Yeah, and, and us to just being open that we are both white and cis, as far as I know. Uh, yeah. We are not immune to these things. As far as we know at this point, we are white and cis. As far as we know to this point, we are white and cis. Uh, so, of course, we are not immune to projecting these things ourselves and, and being in our own way racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic. We attempt our best not to be, but these... Accidentally doing these things. We don't mean to. We don't mean to. It just happens. Yes. And if we are getting critiqued for those, that's fine. We're not... We will not be... We are open to critique. We are open to wanting to do better as long as you are... If you... If we upset you... Um, we don't demand that you educate us, but if you want us to be better about it, we are going to respect your criticism. Yeah. And that is essentially it for our trigger warnings with one major caveat of a, of a very large trigger. Yes. Well, this is, uh, our, probably our least favorite topic for the day, but we have to address it. We have to address the fact that someone called Orion Akaba was at the table for the f for the beginning of the campaign. S a person who, for some fans, might be deserving of a trigger warning all of his own. Uh, for those of you who don't know, for the first 27 episodes, Orion Akaba was the 8th player at the table. Um, he isn't anymore. Uh, the exact circumstances surrounding his departure from Critical Role are unknown to this day, and frankly... Those circumstances are none of our business, uh, but it is hard to ignore the tension that is built up at the table leading up to his departure. And uh, yes, to this day, they haven't divulged any details on it. It's just something that happened. Yes. Be that as it may, anything he may or may not have done at the table is literally the least of the problems people have with Orion Akaba. After he left the show, several incidents came to light that involved accusations of intimate partner abuse, some corroborated with restraining orders or audio files, and one or two instances in which there was um, reason to assume he might not have dealt with funds he raised from his fans quite in the way he had pledged to. The information for this is out there, and we encourage you to look it up at, on your own time if you're interested. Uh, it is worth mentioning that none of these things happened in a vacuum, and that there were... Honestly, some horrible things happening to Orion that may or may not have set off this downward spiral. Um, for what it's worth, things seem to have been very quiet around him, as far as we know, uh, at least in recent years. So we're going to try our best to keep it that way. Quiet is good. Quiet is very good. And nevertheless, as okay-ish as he appears to be doing nowadays, his early presence is a point of discomfort for many people. 
If you have ever seen a video compilation of the early episodes and noticed a second Marisha at the table or a life-sized bear next to her or a prompt box over Ryan's face, this is why. We will do our best to pay as little attention as possible to him while we cover the episodes of the show is on, but he was known for a little bit for showboating, so that's not always going to be possible. Keep in mind, we are trying to be sensitive about this and not... Also, try not to get sued yes. for anything we're saying here. <laughs> exactly. We're, we don't promise okay. to always be tasteful, but we're trying to always be uh, reasonable. We can provide information for our opinions on this. But in the end of the day, none of us are really privy to the things that went down between Orion and the cast, or Orion and his previous partners beyond the things they chose to publish sometimes. Yeah, and, and we're not going to speculate. you can find if you want to. We are not interested in no, speculating. we are not. So. We were just interested in getting this out of the way so we don't have to have to explain while we sound extremely unenthusiastic about Orion every single episode he's on. Yes. Anyway. With that out of the way. The next general thing, which is separate from trigger warnings, are spoiler warnings. There is a high chance... We are going to be spoiling campaign one, not just the episode we're talking about at a time, but also future episodes, analyzing character arcs or themes as they happen. Yeah, we are interested in this show. So this is your general warning for all of campaign one. Yeah, uh, we'll probably not spoil anything major, particularly from campaign two, to the best of our ability, but we may on occasion spoil late campaign two. And if we do... Yes, we will spoil it, campaign one. And if we ever do draw comparisons or mention something that happens in campaign two, we will warn about it at the beginning. Same goes for Exandria Unlimited, which is ongoing in time of this recording, or campaign three, which is uh, not even announced by time of recording. <laughs> and honestly, if we're being honest with ourselves, probably campaign four, which might <laughs> which might start running before we are done with this. Yeah. <laughs> Fun, fun, fun. Uh, we will also be warning uh, as they come for spoilers for unrelated pieces of media. Because despite all of us to the contrary, we do actually consider media that is not just critical role. Quite a lot. Whenever there's time in the day for that. <laughs> so heads up, we will be mentioning them as they come. Uh, and let's see. Yes, another point of analysis is of course com narrative comparison. So chances are we are going to be comparing character story arcs moments to other media we have consumed and if we do so and spoil the media in any way we are going to warn yeah. about it do we know any piece of media that is not shira that's a, a good question we don't know really it might just be shira in there no knowing us we're going to talk about naruto and homestuck <laughs> uh those are not percy jackson respectively huh <laughs> Who are us? Who are us, Yana? Who are we? Yes, get to know your hostesses. This late in the episode. Who are we? Well, I'm, I'm Bal. Let's go. You're alphabetically first. <laughs> I'm a goose on the internet. Who are you? How old are you? Yes. Uh, I, You're a goose. I was still raised on the... the uh, the, commu the, the, the age where we were encouraged not to tell... Uh, people on the internet are full names or our ages or where we live. <laughs> but I will say that my name is Ball. I, I am in my mid-20s. Uh, I started watching Campaign 1 around episode 66. Uh, hmm, I am currently working on my master's in fine arts and creative writing, which I'm very proud of. Uh, mostly I, I do writing creatively as a, as a profession and hope to continue doing that, which was really my uh the tool set that i'm bringing into critical role i think um i started watching critical role because i i actually li <laughs> i was in my my sophomore year of of college and uh or maybe in my second semester of freshman it's really hard to remember now but i at some point signed up for a class about role playing game but as part of it we were going to be playing a very like small mini campaign uh, and i wanted to learn how to play dungeons and dragons and i got 
forward to, to Critical Role as an example. Uh, and then really? I, yeah, that's how I started watching Critical Role. That's the first time hearing about this. Wow. Uh, well, I started watching like in the beginning of summer and I watched, I tried to watch episode one and then I was like, oh, this is, um, this is four hours mm-hmm. long. I'm not going to watch this. And then I waited three months until it was August. And then I watched it and I like watched, I was pretty much caught up by the time I, uh, by the time like the, the fall semester had ended. Uh, so Yeah. My first love episode was 66 in Campaign 1, and I, I still, I've watched pretty much most of Campaign 2, but Campaign 1 still has my heart. Would you? All right. There are some parallels happening. <laughs> um, I'm going to go by Yana, because telling Val to refer to me as anything else is going to be futile at this point. <laughs> um, you might have seen me online as Vohalika. I have a crumbs of Tumblr fame. Bal has, t- has way more Tumblr and Twitter fame than I do. Not really, but sure. I have fame, fame friends. Yeah, that too. You have the fame friends. Um, so, I was also raised at the time where we wouldn't say your real names on the internet. Or ages. Well, no, yeah, okay, I did, I did tell people my age because I was very proud to be so young and on the internet, which I don't do. I am no longer young. I am approaching. I'm pro. No, I'm basically in my nebulous late twenties at this time. I um. Also, and this is going to sound confusing. Currently, in the pursuit of something that's between a second law degree and a bar exam, which are separate things you do where I'm from, which is Germany. Do not ask me about German on Critical Role, please. I might volunteer information, but don't. <laughs> Stones. Um, You're not going to like the answer. Yeah. I did write a series about it on my on my Tumblr at the beginning of Campaign 2, which I also have watched, like, I think the first 120 episodes of, but less enthusiastically as it went on. And I've been with Val for the finale for reasons. Yeah, um... I got into the show shortly after she did. We were, we weren't speaking at the time. We didn't know each other yet. Um, it was recommended to me by a very good friend called Connor, who was very into it. So I once attempted to watch episode one in like um, like spring of twenty sixteen, I'd say. But as we are going to cover very soon, episode one is not beginner friendly at all. So after. Trying this for an hour, then falling asleep and being frustrated. It happened. It just so happened a few weeks later that my entire Tumblr, Tumblr dashboard was overflown by gift sets of a very dramatic scene that happened in episode 68. And then I asked Connor if she was okay because that very dramatic scene involved her favorite character. I knew that much. She was not okay. Well, she wasn't sure if she was okay. It's complicated. We'll get to it. <laughs> and then I looked at what was happening. I dis- I am an absolute sucker for this. And I discovered there was shipping in a D&D game. None of these things that happened when I had played role-playing games beforehand with a very bad DM and a very bad party. Horrible, 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 horrible time. Um, so I kept a close eye on the occurrences of episode 69 and then decided, yeah, okay, this looks like my shit. And then I started watching, and my first live episode was ke- was episode 70, without first watching the 70 preceding episodes. I watched episode 69, and that's it. I started watching episode 70, it was confusing. <laughs> and I then uh, caught... I was caught up by the time of episode 72, I remember that. And then I just... Because I was very lost in time, and... and the a law educa- legal education in Germany is very unstructured in the beginning. The closer you get to your first degree, which it's not a degree, it's complicated. So I was very much in charge of my own time and could just get up at 4 a.m. and watch these episodes as they were happening for the rest of Campaign 1 and the first 20-ish episodes of Campaign 2. After that, life watching became hard because getting up at 4 a.m. is not very sustainable when you're like an adult person living in a society. So that stopped. Yes. So, yeah. Now, why are we two random people on this together? Well, we have 
We have already informed you that we are both very biased towards Vex. Yes. Uh, we also have we also have We're also on biases. Tumblr. Yes, we're also on Tumblr. We also have similar biases when it comes to less positive things. Yes. We enjoy being positive together, but we were ultimately, I think, back in the day when the fandom was small, you mostly connected to people via being salty about the same stuff. Yes. I think that's still a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's probably still a thing. Probably still a thing. But, yeah, I think we, we met each other through salt and we stayed together through uh, liking the same stuff. Which is a, a, a redemption arc, I suppose, but we... Uh, I, I, sort of. <laughs> I can't quite remember the order of operations, because at this point it's, it has been coming on to, to four years since we started talking. Right. It was uh, late campaign one. At some point you approached me... Yeah, I think late campaign one was when I started approaching you about things, right? Yeah. Because you have to understand that we were both active on Tumblr and Baal was the person with the funniest tags. <laughs> Good takes and funny tags. And you just... And I was just in a phase where I was like, oh, people here are great and awesome and this is a funny person. I'm going to talk to them. I tried to talk to you so many times. <laughs> so many times and you didn't succeed. I'm just very... Eventually. I am very standoffish with new people, so it took, took you a lot of tries to... Eventually, it convinced me that that uh, I need to to open up and talk to you, and we very quickly. Yeah, I think what finally got it to stick was was being salty about the comics that started. Oh yeah, the comics and and the comics, and I think some some campaign months that were happening at the same time, and we both wound up being salty about it and started talking, and and we hit it off very quickly because we found that we had like very similar takes on. Numerous things throughout campaign one that we we didn't really have much of an opportunity to talk to other people about. Uh, the the culture of positivity yes. wasn't as much of a thing back then, but it was still present. No, <laughs> no, the fandom was a very different place. It was. It was a very. It was a bit more of a wild west, but I think at some point, uh, some more and less of that. Like I think my favorite comparison for fandom at the time was for the critical role fandom on predominantly Tumblr at the time mm -hmm. was that we were like. Sort of a high school cafeteria, <laughs> where we could, where, like, you would see most people around at some places, but we could stick to our own tables and occasionally start food, start food fights with the other tables. Yeah, and we decided to, to both eat our lunch in the bathroom together. With two other dear friends who we are on, on a four-person Discord table with, with, and I think every number above that is just going to lead to drama. <laughs> yeah. As we have learned many times over the course of Campaign 2, Fandom Discord servers are usually a mistake. The fact that we've been going for so long without uh, severe drama happening is, is a testament to uh, the fact that we picked good people. No, you are not in fight. Yes. Sorry, audience. This is for us. If we ever go into some sort of monetization bits, maybe we can have a Discord server for a Patreon. But, um, Even then, it will be second in our hearts. Second in our hearts, and that's a lot of ifs there. <laughs> Well, that's that's us. That's how we started being friends. Uh, that's how we got into Critical Role and, and met each other through it. Uh, we hope that this session one has been a, a fair introduction to our campaign and has, has made you want to listen to it. Or just warned you off before you can get salty about being subjected to our voices all the time. <laughs> that's true. And we are going to be very talkative, so you're going to be hearing a lot of us. Yes. Like, again, we're going to attempt to cover... 115 episodes of a show with an average length of like four and a half hours. And trying... We're trying to keep our podcast shorter than the actual episodes. Which is difficult, but we strive. And we do it for you, audience. We do it for you. Do we, though? Do we, though? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it's like equal parts our need to have an audience and just our need to ramble about Critical Role a lot. Yes. At least make it something worthwhile. Uh, this is just powered by rambling. This this might as well be our tagline: is a uh, crook roll back powered by rambling. Pretty much, pretty much. Pretty much. Yes. So, yes. So now you are all up to speed and could commence to listen to our first episode. This was a session zero. This doesn't count. Our first episode covering episode one of Critical Role, 
And while it is a really bad way to introduce newbies. <laughs> wow, it is. Well, it's been a pleasure to it is. speak with you, audience. Uh, I hope this is a... Or at you. At you. I hope this is the start of a beautiful relationship. This, uh, this has been Critical Rollback. My name is Paul. I'm Yana. And we don't have a we don't have and an outro line, so we hoped you move on to episode one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the door's that way. Don't let it hit you on the way out. Bye. Bye. Hello there, this is Jana, coming to you from the future of three months after we recorded this, four months, I feel like it's four months now. Yeah, so getting around to publishing took a while, but here we are now, and you can hear me, so we have published and it's been a while. I just wanted to come in very quickly and clarify some things. So first of all, the structure we painstakingly walked you through, where we plan on splitting our podcasts up into first recapping the episode on a very, very briefly on a very high level, and then covering some thematic aspect of it in more detail. Yeah, so we um, developed that after tr- having a trial run with episode 43 of Campaign 1, which, in case you don't know, is a very thematically dense episode. There is so much going on in there that we just constantly got lost in the weeds, um, just trying to recap, and the entire thing was, I think, two and a half hours long in the end, and still needed more structure. It was just, it was a bit of a mess. However, we have never had that problem since, and we're about six episodes into campaign one right now, the um there's just the early episodes just don't have a lot going on which yeah we all knew that beforehand didn't we it's why it's the most forgettable arc we're still going strong and having fun with it though it's just that we have decided to just go through the episode and analyze whatever feels worthy analyzing or talking about when uh, whenever it comes up yeah, so it is a little less structured, but it's also just a lot less content to go through. More of a free-flowing discussion that way. Also, in case you were missing some things from the trigger list we also walked you through. As it has happened, we have so far... Um, I mean, we try to warn about everything we told you we'd warn you about beforehand. But we've also included warnings for things like body horror when we discuss kind of freaky things that can happen to the human body and um, cannibalism. There's a very long cannibalism thing in episode 3 or so. So what this should tell you is that we are very open to warning, to adding warnings about things that might not be obvious to us and not be included on the most common trigger lists. So if you feel like we missed something that... um, might be a very common trigger, feel free to let us know. Our social media information is available somewhere in the interface of where you're listening to this, probably, where you can find us on the two social media platforms we are comfortable with, Twitter and Tumblr. You can also, if you feel like, if you're not sick of our voices yet and feel like this is something worthwhile, donate our Patreon. But we have. It is also linked to wherever you found this. You can unlock cool extras like getting the outtakes that, like all the ramblings Baal cuts out during the episodes or the show notes where I go through the episodes and make notes about what's happening so we have something to guide us through our um, through our podcasting process. It's for very little money. There's early access in there and some behind the scenes and additional content we might actually end up doing if someone's willing to pay for it, which, uh, yeah, I don't see happening. But if you want to, feel free. 
If you want to pay us really big money, we'll even send you a postcard, a handwritten one. Though you'd have to subscribe for two months to get a postcard from either of us, like from both of us. Yeah. So all of these fun things you can get on our Patreon for your support. Thank you in advance. And final announcement, I'm almost done here. We have uh, decided that even though we made a big thing about how this is a bi-weekly podcast, so published every other week, just to get us started, the first episode is going to be published on November 10th. So a week from now. Yay! Yeah, and that's basically all I wanted to say here. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll hear from us again. Bye.